Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 24 A Strange Girl The summer before, our convoy ship had docked at one of the village villages not far from those part from these parts we needed to buy bulk meat for the restaurant and spend some time in port 60 kilometers farther on there would be a particularly dangerous section of the river which meant our ship could not travel through there at night Certain sections of the river were not equipped with navigation lights. So as not to waste time, we began announcing over our outdoor loudspeaker system, as well as the local radio that we were throwing a party that evening aboard a vessel. The sleek white ship standing at the dock, glistening with a huge array of lights and alive with the music pouring forth from it and inevitably attracted the young people of the village to such occasions. Indeed, on this particular evening, practically the entire local youth population could be seen making its way to the ship's gangplank. Upon coming aboard, like any first-time visitors, they immediately set about taking a look around the whole ship to see what they could see. After touring the main, middle, and upper decks, they ended up congregating in the restaurant and bar. The female contingent, as a rule, took to dancing, while the male half prefer drinking. The unusual circumstance of being on a ship plus the music and alcohol always engendered a state of excitement, occasionally making big trouble for the crew. Almost always there was not enough time and the party goers made a collective appeal to extend the festivities, the festivities, just a big bit longer, say by half an hour, and then more and more into the night. On this particular occasion, I was alone in my cabin, listening to the music, wafting up from the restaurant, and attempting to make modifications to the convoy's schedule for the remainder of the trip. All at once, I felt myself being stared at. I turn around and glimpse her eyes on the other side of the window glass. That was nothing unusual. Visitors often like looking into the ship's cabins. I got up and opened the window She didn't go away. She continued looking at me with some embarrassment. I felt I wanted to do something for this woman standing alone on the deck just outside my cabin. I wondered why she wasn't dancing like the others. Perhaps she was somehow unhappy. I offered to show her around the ship and she silently nodded. I took her all over the ship, showed her the main office, which frequently impressed visitors with its elegant appointments. The rug covering the floor, the soft leather furniture, the computers, then I invited her into my cabin, which consisted of a study, come sleeping quarters, in a carpeted receptor, reception room equipped with, um, with fine furniture, TV and VCR. I was probably most delighted at the time to impress a poor country girl with the achievements of our civilized world. 
I open in front of her a box of candies, pour two glasses of champagne, and thinking to add the finishing touches to the impression, put on a videotape of Vika Saskanova singing Love and Death. The videotape included a number of other songs performed by my favorite artists. She slightly touched a champagne glass to her lips, looked intently at me and asked, A challenge, huh? I expected just about any kind of question except that one. The expedition had indeed turned out to be quite a challenge. What with the difficult navigation conditions on the river and the crew, mainly students from the Marine Academy, smoking pot and pilfering merchandise from the store. We were frequently behind schedule and couldn't get to our planned stops on time, where our arrival had been advertised and advanced. These burdens and other worries often deprived me of the opportunity not only to admire the land, landscape along the river, but even to get a normal sleep. I muttered something meaningless to her, something like, never mind, we'll get through, then turned toward the window, window and polished off my glass of champagne. We went on talking about this, that or the other listening, to the videotape in the background. We talk right up until the ship dock once more at the end of the party cruise. Then I escorted her to the gangplank. Upon returning to my cabin, I made a mental note. There was something very strange and unusual about this woman. And I was left with an unexpected feeling of lightness and brightness after talking with her. That night, I had my first good sleep in many days. At long last, I understood why the woman on the ship had been Anastasia. So that was you, Anastasia. Yes, there in your cabin, I memorized all the songs which I later sang to you in the forest. They were playing while we were talking. You see how simple it all is? How did you happen to come on board? I was interested in seeing what was going on. How you all live, after all, Vladimir. I had been spending my whole time just taking care of Dachniks. That day, I had hurried to the vill village, sold the dried mushrooms, which the squirrels had collected, and bought a ticket to your party cruise. Now I know a lot more about the class of people you call entrepreneurs, and I know you pretty well too. I feel I owe you a huge apology. I did not know how things would turn out, that I would be so drastically altering your future. Only I can no longer do anything about it since they have been, since they have seen to the ful fulfillment of this plan, and they are answerable only to God. For a time now, you and your family will have great difficulties and challenges to overcome, but then that will all pass. Still not understanding what Anasia, Anastasia was specifically talking about, I intuitively felt that something was about to unfold itself to me that would go way beyond the unusual perimeters of our existence, something directly concerning me. I asked Anastasia to tell me in more detail what she meant by altering my destiny and challenges. Listening to her at the time, I simply could not imagine how accurately her predictions would soon start being realized in real life. She continued her recounting, once more bringing me back to events of the past year. Back then on the ship, she said, you showed me everything 
even your cabin, treated me to candies, offered me champagne, and then escorted me to the gangplank. But I did not leave the river blank bank right away. I stood on the shore near some bushes and I could see through the light windows of the bar how the young people of the village were still dancing and having a good time. You showed me everything, but you did not take me to the bar. I guess why I was not appropriately dressed. My head was covered in a shawl. My cardigan was not stylish. My skirt was too long, but I could take off the shawl. My cardigan was neat and clean, and I had pressed my skirt carefully with my hands before I came to see you. I really hadn't taken Anastasia to the bar that evening on account of her rather strange clothes, beneath which, as it was now clear, this young girl had been hiding her remarkably beauty, remarkable beauty, something that immediately set her apart from everyone else. And I said to her, Anastasia, why would you have wanted to go to the bar? Do you mean you would have gone dancing there in your galoshes? Anyway, how would you know what dances young people do today? I was not wearing galoshes at the time. When I exchanged my mushrooms for money to buy a ticket to your ship, I also bought a pair of shoes from the same woman, granted that they were old shoes and were tight on me, but I cleaned them with glass. As for dancing, all I would need is a one-time look, and that would be it. And what a dancer I would be. You were, I suppose, offended at me that night. I was not offended, but if you had taken me to the bar... I do not know whether that would have been a good or a bad thing, but events might have turned out differently and all this might not have happened. But I do not now, but I do not now regret that things happened the way they did. So what happened? What happened that night that was so terrible? After you escorted me off the ship, you did not return right away to your cabin. First you drop in to see the captain, and then the two of you headed for the bar. For you, that was a normal thing to do. The moment you entered, you both made an impression on the public. The captain looked prime and proper in his uniform. Prim the captain looked prim and proper in his uniform. You were very elegant and gave a most respectable appearance. You were known to many in this village, the famous McGrath, the owner of a convoy of ships unique in these parts, and you fully realized that you were making an impression. You sat down at a table with three young country girls. They were all only 18 years old just out of school. The waiters immediately brought champagne, candies, and new wine glasses to your table, prettier than the ones that there were before. You took one of the girls by hand, bent over, and started whispering something in her ear. Compliments. I understand they are called. Then you danced with her several times, and the conversation continued. The girl's eyes were radiant as if she were in another world, a fairy tale world. You took the girl out on deck and gave her a tour of the ship, just she had me. You took her into your cabin and treated her to champagne and candies just like me. But there was something a little different in the way you behave with this young girl. You were in a cheerful mood. With me, you were serious and even Marus, but with her you were cheerful, cheerful. I could see all that very well through the lighted window of your cabin, and possibly I felt a little as though I wanted to be there in the place of that girl. You don't mean to tell me you were jealous, Anastasia. 
I do not know it was somehow an unfamiliar feeling for me. I recall that evening and these young country girls who were trying so hard to look older and more modern. The next morning, Captain Shinchenko and I once again had a laugh at their nighttime antiques on the dock. Then in my cabin, I realized that this girl was in such a state that she was ready to go to any length. But I didn't have any thought about wanting to possess her. I told Anastasia about this and she replied, Still, you had stolen her heart. The two of you went out on deck. It was drizzling and you threw your jacket over the girl's shoulder. Then you took her back to the bar. What were you doing, Anastasia, standing the whole time in the bushes in the rain? That was nothing. The drizzle was good and caressing. Only it interfered with my view, and I did not want my skirt and shawl to get wet. They were my mother's. My mother left them to me, but I was very lucky. I found a cell of arm fain bag on the shore. I took off my skirt and shawl, put them in the bag, and hid it under my cardigan. Anastasia, if you didn't go home and it started to rain, you should have come back to the ship. I could not have done that. You had already seen me off and you had other concerns. Besides, everything was shut, was shutting down. When the party came to an end and the ship was due to depart, at the girl's request, especially the girl who was with you in your cabin, you delayed the departure. At that point, everything was in your power including their hearts, and you were intoxicated with this power. The young people of the village were grateful to the girls, and the girls too felt imbued with a sense of power through you. They completely forgot about the young lads who were with them in the bar, guys they had been friends with in school. You and the captain escorted them to the gangplank. Then you went back to your cabin. The captain went up to the bridge, and then the signal sounded, and the ship slowly, very slowly began to pull away from the dock. The girl you had desperate stood on the shore, besides her girlfriends, and the young people who had waited around to see the ship off. Her heart was beating so strongly, it was almost trying to leap out of her breast and fly away. Her thoughts and feelings were all mixed up. Behind her back could be seen the outlines of the village houses with their darkened windows, while in front of her, the sleek white steam ship was departing forever, illuminated with a host of lights, still abundantly pouring forth its music across the water and the nighttime river bank. The sleek white ship was where you were. After saying so many marvelous things to her, she had never heard before. So charming and alluring. And all that was slowly distancing itself from her forever. Then she decided to do something in the sight of everyone. She squeezed her fingers into her fists and began shouting desperately. I love you, Vladimir. And she did it again and again. Did you hear her shouting? Yes, I replied. You could not help hearing her. And members of your crew heard her too. Some of them went out on deck and began laughing at the girl. I did not want them to laugh at the girl. Then they stopped laughing as if they had suddenly come to their senses. But you did not come out on deck and the ship continued slowly moving away. She thought you could not hear her, and she continued stubbornly crying out, I love you, Vladimir. Then some of her girlfriends joined in, and they all cried out together. I wonder what that feeling was like, love, which makes people lose control of themselves, or perhaps... I wanted to help that girl, and so I shouted with them, 
I love you, Vladimir. It seemed as though I had forgotten at that moment that it was not enough just to simply utter words. There definitely had to be behind them feelings and awareness and trustworthiness of natural information. Now I know how strong that feeling is and it is hardly subject to reason. The country girl later began to go into a slump and take to the bottle and it was a challenge for me to help her. Now she was married and burdened down with everyday cares and I've had and I have had to add her love to mine. The story of the girl threw me a little off balance. Anastasia's account managed to resurrect that evening in my memory in full detail and everything had really happened just as she said. It was very real. Anastasia's unique declaration of love did not make any impression on me. After seeing her lifestyle and getting to know how she looked at the world, I saw her more and more at some unreal personage. Even though she was sitting right beside me and I could simply reach out my hand and touch her. A consciousness accustomed to judge things by other criteria could not accept her as an existing reality. And while at the beginning of our encounter, I had been attracted to her, she no longer aroused in me the emotions I once had. I asked, so you think these new feelings appeared in you just by chance? They are desirable, they are important, replied Anastasia. They are pleasant even, but I wanted you to love me too. I realized that once she got to know me and my world a little more closely, you would not be able to accept me as a normal person, as simply men. Perhaps you would even be afraid of me occasionally. And that is exactly what happened. I myself am to blame. I have made many mistakes. I was anxious for some reason all the time. I was in a hurry and I did not have the time to explain everything to you as I should. Perhaps it is, it, perhaps it is, perhaps it all just turned out silly, huh? Do I need to reform myself? And with those words, her lips hinted at a sad smile. She touched her breast with her hand and at once remembered what had happened that morning when I was in the glade with Anastasia. Anastasia, book one, chapter 25, Bugs. That day, I had decided to join an Anastasia morning routine. Everything went fine at first. I sat under the tree and touched various little shoots. She told me about different herbs and they I lay down beside her on the grass. We were both completely naked, but even I wasn't cold. That might have been of course due to my running through the forest with her. I was in a splendid mood. I felt a sense of lightness and not just physical, physically, but inside me as well. It all started when I first, when I felt a pinching sensation on my thigh. I raised my head and saw a small army of bugs crawling along my thigh and lower leg, including ants and some sort of beetles. I lift my arm to swat them, but to no avail. Anastasia seized my arm in midair and held it, saying, Do not touch them. And she got up on her knees in front of me, bent over and pinned my other hand to the ground. I lay there as if crucified. I tried to free my arms, arms but couldn't. I felt that was impossible. 
Then I tried to jerk myself free. With great effort, she kept restraining me with very little effort, her smile never fading from her face. And still my body felt more and more crawling things, all tickling, biting, and pinching. And I came to the conclusion that they were starting to eat me alive. I was in her hands, both literally and figuratively. Taking stock of the situation, I realized that nobody knew where I was. Nobody would come here looking for me. And if they should happen to wander by, they would see my picked over bones. Indeed, if they saw my bones at all. And all sorts of things flashed through my head at that moment. And this was no doubt the reason my instinct for self-preservation kicked in, dictating the only feasible course of action in the situation. In desperation, I sucked my teeth with all my might into Anastasia's bare breast, at the same time jerking my head from side to side. Upon hearing her scream, I immediately loosened my grips on her breasts. Anastasia loosened her, loosened her hold, jump up, one hand holding her breast, the other stretched upward, waving. She tried to smile. I too jumped up and shouted at her, feverishly brushing the crawling things off my leg. You wanted to feed me to those vermin, you forest rich? Well, I don't give in that easily. She continued wavering and responding with a forced smile to the elements of nature around her, which had begun reacting warily to her situation. Anastasia looked at me and slowly, not with her usual spreaded gait, walked toward the lake, her head bowed. I kept standing in the same spot for some time, thinking what I should do next. Returned to the riverbank. But how would I find the way? Follow Anastasia, but what would be the point? Nevertheless, I headed for the lake shore. Anastasia was sitting on the shore, rubbing turfs, tufts of grass between the palms of her hands and dabbing its juice on that part of her breast, where a huge bruise left by my bite was clearly visible. It was probably very painful for her, but what had been her thought in attempting to restrain me? I hovered around her for a little while before asking, does it hurt? Without turning her head, she replied, it hurts more inside. And she silently continued rubbing in the juice from the tufts of grass. Why were you thinking to play tricks on me? I was trying to be helpful. The pores of your skins are all plugged up. They cannot breathe. The little bugs would have cleaned them out. It is not that painful. In fact, it is rather pleasant. And the snake I saw wouldn't it have stung me in the leg? It was not doing you any harm. Even if it had released its venom, it would have been only on the surface and I would have rubbed it in at once. The skin and muscles on your heel are deteriorating. That's on account of a car accident, I said. For a time, neither of us, neither of us spoke. The whole situation felt rather silly. Not really knowing what to say, I asked her. What happened? Why did you not that invisible someone help you again as before when I lost consciousness? The reason he did not help was that I was smiling. And when you began biting me, I tried to smile. I began to feel uncomfortable in her presence. 
Picking up a tuft of grass, I rubbed it in between my hands as hard as I could, then knelt down in front of her and began dabbing her bruise with my moistened palms. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 26 Dreams Creating the Future Now that I have learned more about Anastasia's feelings, about her desire to show in spite all of her extraordinary traits, that she is still man, a normal natural human being, I realize what mental anguish I had caused her that morning. With, once again, I apologized to her. Anastasia responded that she wasn't angry, but now, after what she had done, she was afraid for me. What could you have possibly done that could be so frightful? I asked. And once again, I heard for the tea time, a story nobody should put forward seriously. If they expect to be considered as normal as all the other people in our society. Nobody talks that way about themselves. When the ship left, Anastasia went on. And the young people headed back to the village. I stood for a while all by myself on the riverbank. And I felt good. Then I ran off to my forest. The day passed as usual, but in the evening, when the stars had already come out, come out, I lay down on the grass and began dreaming and then work out this, this plan. What kind of plan? You see the things that I know are partially known by various people of the world you live in. Collectively, they know practically everything, only they do not fully understand how it works. Then I went and fancify how you will go to a large city and tell many people about me and my explanations. You will do this using the same method by which you usually spread any kind of information. You will write a book. A great many people will read it and the truth will unfold to them. They will have fewer ailments. They will change your attitude toward children and, and work out a whole new way of educating people. I mean, in educating, they will work out a whole new way of educating them. People will become more loving and the earth will begin to emit more radiant energy. Artists will paint my portrait and such portrait will be their very best masterpiece. I shall try to inspire them. They will make what you call a movie and it will be the grandest film ever made. You will look at all this and remember me. You will meet wise people who will understand and appreciate what I told you and they will explain a lot of things to you. You will trust their word more than mine and realize that I am not a witch but actually man a human being it is just that I have more information inside me than other people what you write will be of tremendous interest and you will become rich you will have money in the banks of 19 countries and you will visit holy places and cleanse yourself of all the darkness that is in you you will remember me and begin to love me. You will have the desire to see me again and to see your son. You will desire to become worthy of your son. My dream was so clear, but possibly a bit pleading too. That is probably why everything happened the way it did. They took it as a plan of action and decided to carry people through the dark forces window of time. That is permitted if the plan is formulated in detail on the earth, in the heart and mind of an individual man, an earth dweller. No doubt, they took this as a grandiose plan. Perhaps they added something themselves.
And that is why the forces of darkness have been hard at work of late. They have never been this active before. I realize this from the ringing cedar. Its rays has become a lot more powerful lately and the ringing has got louder. The cedar is hurrying to give back its light and its energy. As I listen to Anastasia, I begin thinking more and more and that she was utterly crazy, that maybe she had long ago escaped from some As As Assam and was living there in the forest. And here I had gone and slept with her, and now she might have a child. What a tell indeed. Still seeing how serious and concerned she was as she talked with me, I tried to calm her down. Don't you worry, Anastasia. Your plan is obviously unrealizable, and there's no need for the forces of darkness and light to fight each other. You don't have a detailed enough knowledge about our everyday life. It's laws and conventions. The thing is that an awful lot of books are being published right now. But for some reason, even the works of well-known authors aren't selling. I'm no writer, and so I don't have either the talent or ability or education to write anything. That is correct. You, do, you did not have these things earlier, but now you do, she declared in response. Okay. I kept trying to assuage her fears. Even if I tried, nobody would print it or believe in your existence. But I do exist. I exist for those for whom I exist. They will believe and help you, just as I shall later help them. And together with those people, we. I couldn't make sense of what she was saying right off. And one more, I made an effort to calm her down. I shan't even make an attempt to write anything. There's absolutely no sense in it. Don't you get it? Believe me, you shall. They have already created a whole network of circumstances that will make you do this. What am I? Thank you? A puppet? What, what am I? Thank you? A puppet in somebody's hands? And so much depends on you. But the forces of darkness will try to stop you with all the tricks in their arsenal. They will even try to drive you to suicide by creating an illusion of hopelessness. Enough, Anastasia. Anastasia, that's it. I'm sick and tired of listening to your fantasies. <laughs> you think they are just fantasies? Yeah, yeah, fantasies. And I stopped short. It began to dawn on me as I calculated the timing in my head. And I understood. Everything Anastasia told me about her dreams, about our son, she had thought up last year, long before I knew her as well as I do now, long before I slept with her. Now a year later, it was coming to pass. So that means it's already coming to pass. I asked her, of course, if it had not been for them and for me too, a little, your second ex expedition would not have been possible. After all, you were scarcely able to make ends meet after the first one, and you did not even have any claim to the ship. You mean to say you influenced the shipping line and the firms that helped me? Yes. So you drove me to ruin and inflicted damage on them. What right have you to interfere like that? And here I've left the ship behind, and I'm sitting here with you. Maybe right now everything's going to pieces back here. You've probably got some kind of hypnotic ability. No worse than that. You're a witch and that's it. Or a crazy hermit. You don't have anything. Not even a house. 
And here you go philosophizing in front of me, your sorcerer. I am an entrepreneur. Do you have an, any idea what that means? I'm an entrepreneur. And even if I'm dying, my ships still ply the river. They will bring goods to people. That's what I do. I bring things to people and I can give you and any items you need. But what can you give me? I, what can I give you? I can give you a drop of heavenly tenderness and I can give you rest. You will be a genuine of bright eye cleverness. As your image, I am blessed. Image, who needs your image? What sense can that express? It will help you write the book for people. Oh, please. There you go again. Doing goodness knows what with this mysticism of yours. So you can't just live like a normal person. Are you sure? I have never done anything bad to anyone and I never can. I am a human being. I am a man. If you are so concerned about earthly goods and money, just wait a little. It will all come back to you. I do owe you an apology for dreaming like that. Dream, dreaming that you will have a time of troubles, but for some reason, I could think of no alternative back then. You do not see the logic. You need to be compelled to see it through the help of circumstances in your world. Excuse me. I couldn't hold out any longer. What's this about being a spell? Compel, being compelled. You do something like that and you still want to be treated as a normal human being? I am a man. A human being. A woman. Anastasia ad agitation was clearly no noticeable in her voice. I only want it. And I still only want the good. I want only the light. I want you to be purified. That is why I thought back then about your trip to holy places, about the book. They have accepted this, and the forces of darkness are always fighting with them. But never have the dark forces scored a major victory. And what about you, I commented, With all your intelligence, information, and energy, are you just going to stand and watch from the sidelines? In a confrontation on the scale between two great principles, my own efforts count for precious little. Help is going to be needed from many others in your will. I shall seek them out and find them, just as I did that time when you were in hospital. Only you need to de develop a little more of that conscious awareness. You need to overcome the bad within yourself. I'd like to know just what's so bad within myself. What did I do wrong when I was in hospital? And how could you have treated me when you weren't here beside me? Back then, you simply did not feel my presence, but I was right there with you. You were on the ship. I bought you a little branch of the ring and cedar, which Mama had broken off before she died. I left it in your cabin. When you invited me in, you were ill even then. I could feel it. Do you remember the branch? Yes, I reply. In fact, that branch hung on the wall of my cabin for some time. Many of my crew noticed it, and I brought it back to Novabus. But I didn't pay any attention to it. You simply threw it out, but I had no idea. No, you had no idea you threw it out, and Mama's branch did not succeed in overcoming your illness. Then you went into hospital. When you get back, take a close look at the history of your illness. If you check the chart, you will see that in spite of taking the very best medicine available, there was no improvement. But then they gave you some cedar nut oil. Now, according to strict prescription regulation, 
The doctor was not supposed to do that, but she did. In spite of the fact that there was not a single mention of it in your medical prescription guide and nothing of the sort had ever been done before. Do you remember? Yes. You were being treated by a woman who was a sector head in one of the best clinics in your city. But the sector had nothing to do with your particular illness. She left you there, even though just one floor up, there was another sector specifically corresponding to your illness, right? Yes. She would prick you with needles and turn on some must must music in the half darkened room. Anastasia account was in complete accord with what had actually happened to me. Do you remember this woman? Yes. She was in charge of a sector in the former district council hospital. And then all at once, Anastasia, her eyes fixed intently on me, spoke several disconnected phrases, which immediately shocked me and caused a shiver up and down my spine. What kind of music do you like? Fine. Like that. Not too loud. And she spoke these phrases in exactly the voice and with the intonation used by the sector head who treated me. Anastasia, I exclaimed. She didn't let me finish. Keep listening. Do not be shocked for God's sake. Do try, try to make sense of everything I am telling you. Get your mind forces working, at least a little. It is all very easy, you see, for man. And she went on. This woman doctor, she is very good. She is a real doctor. I got along with her very well. She is kind and forthright. It was I who did not want you to be transferred to the other sector. That sector would have corresponded to your particular illness, but hers did not. She requested her supervisors to leave you with her, assuring them she, could, she would take care of you. She felt up to it. She knew your pains were simply the result of something else. And she tried to counteract that something else. She is a doctor. And how did you behave? You kept on smoking and drinking to your heart's content eating salty and spicy food, and that in spite of your serious ulcer. You did not deny yourself anything in the way of pleasure. Somehow, your subconscious got a message, even though you were not aware of it, that there was nothing terribly wrong with you, that nothing would happen to you. I did not accomplish anything good, rather the opposite. The darkness in your consciousness did not lessen, nor did your will or sense of awareness improve. When you regained your health, you sent one of your employees to thank the woman who saved your life. You yourself did not call her, not even once. She was waiting for you to call. She had such a feeling of love for you. She, or you, Anastasia. We if that is clearer to you. I got up and for some reason took a few steps away from Anastasia, who was sitting on a falling tree. The mixed up state of my feelings and thoughts caused even greater uncertainty as to how I should think about her. Now look, once again, you are not understanding how I do things. You are becoming confused, but it is a simple thing to grasp. I do things with the help of my imagination and my ability to analyze possible situations. And now you have started thinking ill of me again. She fell silent, her head resting on her knees. And I stood there too without saying a word, thinking. She keeps on talking and talking and saying all sorts of incredible things. 
it's clear she has no idea that any normal person would not accept them and so would not accept her as a normal person. Still, I went over to Anastasia and brushed her cascading braids of her hair from her face. Tears were rolling down her cheeks from her large bluish gray eyes. She smiled and said something quite uncharacteristic. She's just another one of those soppy females, huh? Right now, you are overwhelmed by the very fact of my existence and do not believe your eyes. You do, you do not fully believe and you cannot even make sense of my sitting here talking to you. You find both my existence, existence and my abilities amazing. You have completely ceased accepting me as a normal human being, as man. But believe me, I am a human being and not a witch. You consider my way of life amazing. But why does not a certain something else seem just as amazing, even paradoxical to you? Why do people admit the earth to be a celestial body, the greatest creation of the supreme mind, with each system, component as his greatest achievement, and then go tear the system apart and devote so much effort to its destruction? You see, a manufactured spaceship or aeroplane as something natural, in spite of the fact that all its components are made of broken or remelted parts of the original supreme system. Imagine a being who breaks off a piece of an airplane in flight and uses his part to make himself a hammer or a scrapper and then praises himself for having succeeded in making a primitive tool. He does not understand that one cannot keep breaking pieces of a flying airplane indefinitely. How can you not grasp that our earth must not be tortured like that? A computer is considered to be an achievement of the human mind, but few realize that the computer may simply be compared to a prosthetic of the brain. You can imagine what would happen to a person with normal healthy legs if they walk on crutches all the time naturally their legs their leg muscles would atrophy no machine will ever be superior to the human brain provided the brain is kept in constant training anastasia wiped away a tear rolling down her cheek and stubbornly persisted and elucidating the incredible revelation stemming from her extraordinary logic. At the time, I had no idea how everything she said would arouse millions of people, set the minds of scholars, or stir, and even as mere hypothesis, proved to be without peril anywhere in the world. According to Anastasia, the sun is something like a mirror. It reflects emanation from the earth which are invisible into the eyes. These emanation come from people in a state of love, joy, or some other radiant feeling. Reflecting off the sun, they return to earth in the form of sunlight and give life to everything on the planet. She brought up a whole array of supporting arguments which were not that simple to grasp. If Earth and other planets were simply consumers of the sun's grace of light, she said, it would be extinguished or burn unevenly and its glow would be off kilter. In the universe there is and can be no lopsided process. Everything is interrelated. She cited to the words of the Bible, and the life was the light of man. Anastasia also stated that one man's feeling can be transmitted 
to another by reflecting of the celestial bodies. And she demonstrated this by the following example. Nobody on earth can deny that you can feel when somebody loves you. This feeling is especially noticeable when you are with a person who loves you. You call it intuition. In fact, invisible light waves emanate from the one who loves. But the love can be felt if it is strong enough. Even when the individual is absent, by drawing upon this feeling and understanding its nature, one can do wonders. This is what you call miracles, mysticism, or incredible abilities. Tell me, Vladimir, do you not feel a bit better, better with me now? Somehow lighter, warmer, more fulfilled? Yes, I reply. For some reason, I have started to feel warmer. Now watch what happens when I concentrate, concentrate on you even more stronger. Anastasia lowered her eyelids ever so slightly, slowly stepped back a few paces and stopped. A pleasant feeling of warmth started running through my body. It gradually intensified but didn't burst into flame and didn't make me hot. Anastasia turned and began to slowly walk away, hiding behind the thick trunk of a tall tree. The sensation of pleasant one did not lessen, and to it was added another, as though something were helping my heart pump blood through my veins. And with every heartbeat, came the impression that the bloodstreams were instantly reaching every little vein in my body. The soles of my feet broke out into a heavy sweat and became very moist. You see? Now is it all clear to you? Anastasia said as she triumphantly reappeared from behind the tree, confident she had proved something to me. You see? You felt all that when I went behind the tree trunk, and your sensations even increased when you could not see me. Tell me about them. And I told her, and then she asked in turn, What does the tree trunk show? What do you think the waves of information and light went directly from me to you? When I hid myself, the tree trunk was supposed to significantly distort them, since it has its own information and its own glow. But this did not happen. The ways of feeling began failing, falling directly upon you, reflecting of the celestial bodies, and even intensified. Then I caused what you call a miracle. Your feet began to perspire. You failed to mention that fact. I didn't think it was important. How do my feet perspire? How do my feet perspiring constitute a miracle? I chase all sorts of disease out of your body through your feet. You should feel a lot better now. It is even noticeable on the outside. You are not slouching as much. Indeed, I was feeling better physically. So when you concentrate like that, you dream up something and whatever you, you want comes to pass. That describe it more or less, more or less. And does what you dream about always come to pass, even when you're asking for something besides bodily healing? Always, as long as it is not an abstract dream, as long as it is detailed down to the mind Min minutest aspects and does not contradict the laws of spiritual being. I do not always manage, however, to come up with a dream like that. 
crystal has to proceed extremely quickly and there must be a corresponding vibration of feeling. And then it would definitely come to true. It is a very natural process. It happens in the lives of many people. Ask around among your acquaintances. Perhaps you will find some among them who have dreamed this way and their dream have come true either fully or partially. Detailed thinking proceeding extremely quickly. Tell me, when you were dreaming about the poets and artists in the book, was that all in, in detail too? Did you thought did your thought proceed quickly then? Extraordinary quickly. And everything was so specific down to the finest detail. So now you think it's going to come true. Yes, it will. There wasn't anything else you dreamed about at the time. You told me everything about your dreams. Not everything. Then tell me everything. Do you do you really want to hear it, Vladimir, really? Yes. Anastasia's face brightened as though illuminated by a flash of light. It was with inspiration and excitement that she continued her incredible monologue. <laughs>